Yes, <clears throat> thanks very much for the for the kind introduction. Um, I don't have any slides uh, today, but I want to give you a, or, or present a few ideas about what what I have in mind in terms of the climate landscapes and the topics we are talking about. Um, unfortunately, I had to step out for some time during the afternoon due to some other things, but uh, I hope this is uh, still helpful. Um, yeah, so to say a little bit where I'm coming from, I'm actually not working at, at the, the landscape, landscape scale. I'm, I'm running uh, with my team global scenarios on, on land use change and the interaction between agricultural production, um, also forestry, um, water use, etc. So, so man, linking many of the topics here, but but um, in uh, <clears throat> in computer-based scenarios and and at a very large scale. But I still think that these issues are are relevant, and I'm also interested in interactions across scales. So linking from global level to national level to subnational level, because uh, of course things about land use, land use management, land use planning are, of, of course, interrelated because um, we have international trade, we have technology transfer, uh, and so on. Um, so I'm coming from the large scale, and um, but we try to, to integrate um, more or less all relevant land use types in our modeling, and I think that's what is relevant for the, <clears throat> for the conference here. So what are the challenges which I see related to, to climate change and, and landscape change? So of course, we have a number of, of climate change impacts. Uh, we are expecting um, changes in temperature in either too much rain or too little rain, um, too much water, too little water, depending on, on the, the specific uh, landscape. Um, so, so one big challenge is how to how to adapt um, agriculture, forestry, and and landscapes as a whole. How to adapt to a changing climate, uh, <clears throat> depending, of course, how successful society will be in in um, limiting climate change, and especially extreme events uh, which are already occurring, which will become more frequent, <clears throat> are a challenge to um, to adaptation in many sectors. So the question here is how to design and how to create climate resilient landscapes, as, as I would call it. But then we, of course, also have climate change mitigation uh, and uh, ambitious climate change mitigation. Um, we are running scenarios how to achieve the 1.5 or, or 2 degree global temperature target. And this, in many of the scenarios we are running, which are also fed into the IPCC reports, et cetera, um, the, the, the land use or the agriculture and, and forestry sector play a major role in terms of uh, biomass production, partly maybe biomass for bioenergy, but also biomass for, for materials, uh, wood as a building material or, or biomass for <clears throat> synthetic fibers or everything. So. So there will be quite a heavy demand um, on, on land for, for climate change mitigation, depending on uh, the scenario you're looking at, and depending on how the energy sector will evolve. And, um, and this means that there will be a demand for storing carbon um, in the land, either through afforestation or through soil carbon management or through um, landscape elements like like hedgerows and and other things so this um, is likely to play an important role in ambitious climate change mitigation uh, scenarios <clears throat> and of course non-co2 emissions like methane and, and nitrous oxide have also to be reduced so this is another challenge uh, to to the landscape um, wherever wherever we are and then apart from climate, there is, of course, the, the challenge, the huge challenge of biodiversity loss so that landscapes, given climate change and adaptation, given climate change mitigation, landscapes have also to be designed in a way to prevent the biodiversity loss. And, and this has implications for the strategy for nature conservation, but also for agricultural production uh, systems, um, a huge topic which, which is interlinked with a lot of climate issues. 
Then we have challenges with respect to nutri nutrient cycles. So the, the, the nitrogen, nitrogen surpluses in intensive uh, agricultural systems are a huge problem, partly related to, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions, partly related to water pollution, but also to uh, air pollution. And um, <clears throat> managing these nutrient cycles will also have um, uh, implications for how, how landscapes um, should be structured and can be structured. And finally, there's the, the, income, the, the, the aspect of income from rural activities, farm income, rural employment, rural development. So whatever happens in landscapes is of course relevant uh, for, um, for the rural economy and, and the people who live in these landscapes. So I think to manage those challenges, there is a huge need for what I would call integrated land use planning. Uh, in a wider sense for, for sustainable development in general. So there are all these objectives which have to be fulfilled. And I think, <clears throat> in my view, we are lacking, uh, we are lacking the tools and the strategies for, for this kind of integrated land use uh, planning. There's also challenges to, to understanding these processes, so challenges to, to modeling or assessment tools, um, because mostly for, for traditional reasons in how science evolves, there are still missing links between the different sectors, between agriculture, forestry, um, nature conservation, and other land uses. If you, if you look out, there are many people who either focus on, on the agricultural sector, on cropland and grassland, or people focusing on forestry, or people focusing on nature conservation, but, but creating this, this this overall picture and, and the integration across those disciplines, I think it's still in an, in an early stage, uh, but this is definitely uh, needed for, for designing climate landscapes or however we want, we want to call it. So that's one challenge to, and then and this goes down to the, to the tools and, and methods which are used. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, the second aspect in terms of the, the understanding and the, and the, the tools is, is those links from, from global to local and the feedbacks. Um, I mean, I'm engaged in, in large-scale model-based scenarios, which, which include international trade in commodities between different uh, countries or world regions. Um, and this has, of course, implications to what happens at the local, at the sub-national scale. But um, Again, there are different communities, people are, who are more focusing on, on really the landscape scale, maybe river basin scales so of the subnational regions and, and people who are working on the, on, on the larger scales, but, but we need to take into account those feedbacks and we need to find methods to, to um, provide linkages here for better understanding. Um, <clears throat> and then there's of course one specific uh, topic for, for the conference here is, is the link between local land use change and interactions with, with hydrology um, and hydrological cycles uh, at different scales. And again, I think there, there, are, there is some, some knowledge around, but um, as we see also in the presentations today, I think there's still a lot, a lot to be done. So, so these tools, need to be developed and, and um, interdisciplinary strategies need to be uh, found. But then um, the next question is, okay, if we, if we improve our understanding, what are then the, the policy tools and policy instruments to induce the changes towards the directions we want to, to see? <clears throat> and again, um, I think there are a lot of interesting parts around, but but I think we also need to engage with people who are um, who have a lot of knowledge uh, in 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 the policy debate. So to give a few examples, um, <clears throat> in terms of, of agriculture and food production, there is of course the Common Agricultural Policy as an example in the EU, um, but also in, in many other uh, countries around the world. So so agricultural policies have to be um, widened in, in scope. I mean, they have to um, go beyond the traditional focus on, on, on farm income um, and, and, and rising, raising production. So I think further reform of the agricultural policy instruments is needed with a broader focus, as, as I outlined with respect to climate change, with, with respect to biodiversity protection, and also with respect to, um, to uh, water protection and, and water cycles. Um, 
instruments for emission reduction are necessary. So, so as an economist, I, I would of course favor uh, certain pricing elements. So pricing on, on greenhouse gas emissions also in, in agriculture and land use. Um, also to, to provide a link between emissions in the energy sector and emissions in, in agriculture and food. Um, in terms of water regulation, um, we could talk about water pricing um, instruments to provide incentives for, for, for agricultural producers, but also for other water users to, to save on water and, and provide, uh, develop strategies to, uh, to treat water wisely uh, in, in the landscapes. And, and of course, there is also the challenge to create policy instruments with respect to biodiversity um, conservation. Um, so there have been attempts in, in parts of Germany, for example, to develop um, eco point schemes or, or um, developing um, yeah, assessments of, of um, biodiversity biodiversity friendliness of different uh, production systems i think there are some examples but but none of that has been has been scaled up um, so so there need to be strategies for for including biodiversity uh, protection and conservation into um, <clears throat> into these uh, policy uh, instruments and in the end uh, i guess it's it's about creating diverse landscapes, I mean, using the, the, the appropriate policy tools to, to incentivize um, the creation of diverse landscapes, where also networks of nature conservation areas are uh, established and, and the interaction between areas of production and areas of land use are um, combined with, with areas which are taken out of use um, but but this needs to be to, to happen in a in a I think in a strategic way to to take into account all these different challenges and, and sustainability goals which are on the table. <clears throat> and that brings me to my final point, um, a, a, an area where I'm not at all much involved in yet is is uh, spatial planning and 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 spatial development, but. Um, I've been recently appointed as one of the member of the uh, scientific advisory board for spatial planning and spatial development. It's, it's um, linked to one of the German federal ministries for, for construction, building and, and living space. And I think um, also the outcomes of this conference could be very valuable in terms of this very integrated uh, and comp comprehensive thinking about landscapes to be brought into the, the standards procedures of spatial planning, of zoning, uh, because from what I learned, I think there is still a lot of knowledge gaps um, about this, this integration across those different um, land use uh, parts or land use areas. And I think this, this implementation in, in this legal process of, of spatial planning and spatial um, um, development is in the end absolutely necessary to, to, to implement the, the appropriate measures on the ground and, and make them legally binding um, and, and really provide clear um, a clear framing and clear um, constraints and conditions for the for the actors on the ground um, to to move into the right direction. I, I see there there are huge uh, challenges, but but at least we, as this conference shows, I mean we are starting to interact and to discuss, and and I see, um, yeah, a lot of potential here if we if we keep this this comprehensive view um, to feed our knowledge um, into these, yeah policy relevant and, and society relevant um, processes and interactions. <clears throat> Thanks very much. That was what I wanted to input today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm always a little bit, uh, what is it, frustrated that on the one side, the solutions are so easy. Um, I mean, coping nature and implementing uh, what, what we see there, like covering the earth always, uh, under so on and with cover crops and whatever and and changing our forest policies and whatever so the the, the methods are really simple in principle 
but but it's so complicated all which lies behind uh, policy management uh, structures whatever uh, so there is no easy easy solution i i see no are you are you asking me about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but, well, I think the issue is that yeah, there there are many many solutions on the table, but right like with other sectors as well. I mean, you have to keep in mind the 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 actors, uh, the the farmers, the, um, the the builders, and so on. I mean, at some point you have to come to clear. Um, regulatory frameworks, I guess, to, to steer people into the right direction. I mean, you will always find pioneers who will do the things out of their own interest and, and, and because they are curious. And I think this is absolutely necessary. Uh, also, for example, if we talk about emission reduction in, in agriculture and food, one of my main topics, it's of course absolutely necessary to have pioneers and have to, to have pilot projects also at a larger scale where you can show that things work, but still you have to work hard, I think, in the policy sphere to, you know, to, to, to work on the majorities to, to really implement regulatory frameworks, which then provide the incentives for others also to, to engage, right? I mean, just by, but just by um, um, kind of, um, asking people to change their modes of operation or to change their behavior, I think will only go so far in terms of, you know, the, the, the share of the population which you, which you will con convince. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Uh, I think on the one side, the movement starts uh, like bottom up. It's as you said, there are the pioneers uh, doing, going the first steps, but then later the policy and the top down method must be implemented so that it uh, takes a larger scale implementation. So, so to take the example of renewable energies from what I learned, I mean, there are these planning laws and zoning laws, for example, in, in Germany, but in principle, like the, the local community has, has quite a bit of space to, to set priorities and so on. And so de depending on how, how active and how engaging the local community is or the, uh, the mayor of a town or of a community, you know, one, one community has a lot of um, um, wind power uh, um, machines or a lot of solar panels and others have, have not. So, so um, yeah, I think it's a combination of, of people moving forward and, and, and creating solutions and then for others also the, the, the regulatory framework to, to incentivize um, um, others. So it's, yeah, it's hard. And, and, and the, the issues we are talking about are also fairly complex, right? That's the other thing that nowadays many people are quite specialized for good reason in, in their area of work, but, but the issues we are tackling with here are really highly interdisciplinary and you know, take agriculture and forestry. I mean, I come from agricultural sciences, but I didn't learn anything about forestry, right? So, so this is really like two sectors and, and even, you know, there's not much interaction, but if you talk about integrated land use, uh, I mean, you know, it has to be combined uh, in a way, but, but uh, that maybe it got lost a bit over the last uh, decades or so. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Yes.